Okay, uh, hi everybody. Good afternoon. Thank you for coming. I know everybody is a little, a little sleepy because the lunch and everything. So thank you for coming so much. So this afternoon, um, I am going to talk about how to learn about the new things we have in Drupal 8 via the bugin, because there are a lot of new things to learn in Drupal 8. So about me, uh, my name is Eduardo Garcia, but only my mother called me like that. You can call me Enzo, and you can find me in social networks and GitHub and etc. using N Solutions. This is my nickname. And we know it's a, a new company. I just started just to be concentrated in providing Symfony 2 and 3 and Drupal 8 Consulting, just if you are interested, located in USA. <laughs> And this is the agenda. I am going to talk about dependencies, site, the storage, services, roads, plugins, and events. This is our, like, uh, the main concepts in Drupal 8 that we need to be familiar if we want to be, became a Drupal 8 developer. All of them are new in Drupal 8. So that's mean if you are, even if you are a Drupal 7 developer, you have a lot to learn. So in my opinion, um, the UI for site builders or teamers the change is not really huge, even that because we have tweak in Drupal 8. Uh, it's just for front-end developers, they need to learn something new every three weeks. Because every three weeks, they have some new framework in JavaScript. So I got some more, some mil older than some JavaScript framework. So it's like a every day. Um, for site, in site building perspective, the menus and everything is similar. And actually, they have a lot of improvements. But this is like a little, in, with a little intuition, you could figure out everything. But from the uh, back develop, backend perspective, everything changed. I could say almost 90% of the things are new. So all the, all the knowledge we have is like, a, it's good to know, but <laughs> it's not functional now. So with, which tool I am going to talk today? Um, I am going to talk about Drupal Console, which is a Drupal CLI, and I, I am a co-maintainer of this project. We have been working on this project for almost three years. And Composer, which is your best friend if you pretend to be a Drupal 8 developer. So first, let's start with the system. If you install Drupal console in your, in your machine, the first thing you need to run is Drupal check. Why? Because usually, we always blame the product. Uh, we never blame our environment. And usually, the most common error is like a, we are not prepared to run a software. And we are saying this software is a is a crap. But actually, it's not. Usually, you don't have the minimal PHP version. You don't have some PHP extension. Or, you, or even you are not available to connect to, to the database, even if you are your MySQL or SQLite 3. So with this command, it will be analyzed a little bit what, it, what is available in your system. And if you, if you are. Uh, compatible to install Drupal 8. And how we do that? So when you install Drupal console, you need to run a, a command Drupal init. And this uh, command creates some configuration files. And one of them is the PHP check. And then this could be is a custom by your project. That's mean maybe. Maybe this is the minimum requirement for Drupal 8, but maybe in your Drupal 8 side, in your project, you have a library that requires a superior PHP version, 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 then you could change what you want to check. Like, um, could be a PHP 7 if you want, but it's because it's, the, it's specific about your project. Um, you could check, like, a, again, your particularity in your project is about how, many, how much memory is required to run the project, and you could say, this, all these values are just a proposal to have an idea what you need to check. Um, obviously, the time zone uh, is, is important to set. Um, also, we have a, a list of extensions that must to be checked that you have in your system. So the idea is you, you could include more based on what leverage you have in, in, in your system. Because this is like for a standard. If you use something like a integration with Salesforce or MailChimp or something, for sure you need some different extensions, maybe for BCMap or whatever you want. So you put here, and then maybe you put it in, you put it in your in Git, 
repository, and then you are starting a new environment, you run Drupal check, and you say, hey, wait a minute, everything is okay, but those three libraries or the uh, extensions in PHP are not available, so you need to figure out that before to start to work with uh, Drupal 8. Now, let's talk about a little bit about dependencies. <clears throat> As I say, Composer is your new best friend. Um, in, in reality, for me, Symfon um, Drupal 8 is a Symfony 2 application, and usually people don't say that. And for this reason, we have like a you download a seed file, you have a, some distribution in your structure or your folder, but if you use Composer to download Drupal 8, looks different. And it's because the proper way is like our Drupal application must to be similar to a Symfony 2 application. Like a three months ago, there was a security issue with some library I don't remember. And this required a update a library because the library was available from your document root. But if you have a site using Drupal 8 structure, all your libraries are in vendor folder. So even if you have the problem with the code, your vendor never must to be accessible via web. Right? And this is the way Symfony 2 works. And Composer <coughs> try to help you to manage all the, all the dependencies you need to have. So in, for, for Drupal 8 newest people, so we have a Composer JSON in our application. So Composer JSON are inside models, inside themes, or could be inside a big application like Drupal 8 or Symfony. Usually this is a file we change a lot, and the first thing you need to do is validate the changes you include are not broken anything. Um, people say Composer is really slow, and it is most of the time, but this is changing uh, soon because they are working in some changes. But this is, this is, is slow because if you use um, Ubuntu or Debian, maybe you are familiar with apt get stuff, so what apt get stuff do is like when you want to install a library, he verify what is everything in your system and guarantee that the new package is not going to broke your system. It's the same with Composer. So Drupal 8 have their own dependencies. Anytime you install a contribute model or a custom model, they have their own dependency. And anytime when you try to include something, everything must to be consistent. So the, the process to check this consistency is really slow sometimes. But there are, some, there are some techniques to improve that, but this is a complete whole session. So the first thing, you need modify your composer, run composer validate, and then you need to get this composer validate. If it doesn't work, you need to roll back and figure out what is going on in, in your changes. Now, oops, okay, <laughs> composer show. When you download the seed file, from uh, uh, Drupal.org, you get a folder with all the distribution. Uh, this is okay, but the problem is like, the idea is all this folder vendor is like a third party repository that you don't need to take control about the version control. So the good, uh, the, the good practice is install with Composer and put in git ignore, ignore the vendor folder, and then when you push or you share with your friends, they only need to run Composer install. So after run Composer install, you want to run a check about how many libraries and what version you have in your system, you need to run Composer show. So maybe you could ask him, you say, I didn't install all this, those libraries, I, I didn't know, but it's because this is a tree of dependency. So Drupal 8 needs Gosol, Gosol needs this library, and this, and this, and this, so the amount of library we have is huge, but then you can get a little um, perspective about this. As you see, none of them is Symfony, right? I said before, Drupal 8 is a Symfony application, but actually it's like a, the most relevant packages, but actually we ha you use third party for a lot of frameworks, like a same framework for feeds, and we have some packages for uh, Phantom, JS, and so on. So it's like a, we have a little Frankenstein, but it's, everything is orchestrated to work perfectly. So don't surprise if something Sometimes your system doesn't work, but it's because all those dependencies. So now imagine maybe you are having an issue with a specific package. So you try to install something and you say, hey, I cannot install this library because this library is not compatible. And then you say, I didn't install this. Who the hell include this? It wasn't me. Then you say, okay, first I need to check it out. 
if the version I have is the latest version I, I, I have available in internet, so I need to send the package. So one important concept here you, say, you see is gossel HTTP slash gossel. This is how packages are structured. So the first part of the package is the vendor. So the vendor could be a company like Sensial Apps, or a project like Symfony, or same framework, or could be a person like me, and solutions. Uh, and the second part is the library itself. Could be Gossel, could be HTTP client, could be anything. So this is the format. And then I, I am saying, okay, please compare my current installation to check with the, la the internet available thing, what is the, the function. And, and I could review, okay, here, I am running 6.10, but the latest is 6.21, 6 and it's in red, in red, sorry. That means there is a security update between my version and to the online version. So obviously this is something I need to really care about. And I could check it out, some other information, like uh, what is the repo, uh, what is the license, and what libraries are required for this library. So in this case, if you see at the bottom, so Gossel uh, library is using another two libraries from Gossel HTTP vendor, but could be external also. So the reason because the tree of vendor is, is, is really good, big, and it's really good to know about that. So this is similar to Drupal status. Like uh, we get how, what models are updated, what models need to be updated, what models need security things. And it's, it's simple, obviously, it's, like, it's a kind of intuitive. So we, when we, we have a yellow, they say, okay, your version is not the latest. It's yellow, that means there are new features. It's not compulsory to update, but maybe you need to review, uh, maybe there are nice features you could use. And the red one, obviously, is like a, you must to update. <clears throat> You can interrupt me. You have any questions? So don't worry. Sure. Can you repeat that again? Ah, it's totally possible. Well, the, not not possible that because the composer they verify that the update you are trying to do don't have a conflict with the other libraries. But sometimes it's not an easy task to try to be totally good with all dependencies. Sometimes you need to update several versions in different or intermediate versions to, to try to do that. So maybe imagine you have this problem, like you are trying to update a library that you don't know what you have, and then we have the composer why. That is, this library is installed because it's required for this. So in this example, it's a Drupal installation that have Drupal console, and we require Drupal console. But even if you don't have Drupal console, this is a Fabian Potrecien library code that requires Gossel. And this is another, this is what I say, Gaston JS. This is a personal contributor and a, a small component library created for an individual and used for Drupal 8. And then you're Gossel. So it's, it's, not, it's not simple like, oh, I, I am going to remove because it's not possible because you have another libraries. So maybe you could decide it maybe to remove first the library who have the dependency and then install other. It's similar like the dependency inside the, uh, we have in models. Like you cannot uninstall this model because it's dependent for another. Okay. This is a tool created by, by Sensio Labs. It's a security checker. <clears throat> and what they do is they have an um, inventory about the security check reported for packages uh, models. So if you have Drupal installation and you want to know if your system is secure based on the security releases provided in libraries, this tool check your composer, the version you have installed, check their inventory and say, okay, this is, this is an issue hap that happened Two months ago, we got some that introduced a new release in 8.1. And when, at that time, when you run, they say, okay, this Drupal A required Gossel, and this has a critical issue. 
This is similar like a, the Drupal status we have, but this is a third party um, library you need to install. It's, in, it's outside Composer, it's outside Drupal 8, but if you find it in Google's uh, security checker, this is a project in, in, available in GitHub. Okay, so now let's skip the uh, composer part. And let's, let's try to use Drupal console to try uh, to learn a little bit. <clears throat> so if you are in production, we have a command to get the status, similar to the status reports in, in Drupal 8 in the, in the UI. So you got information about your PHP, the extension are available, and you got information about how to connect to the database and get information about what is the document route for the site uh, and everything. So it's like, obviously, this is the first step when you get a new site and then you need to run some performance or whatever, first is run sign status, right? And this is good because you don't, you don't need the Drupal user to do this because you have access to the database. So it's not a problem. So, and now we have the actions in our setting files. Even if you are using something like settings locals or whatever, you, you have the, the availability to create a key value um, array in your settings to be used uh, to um, a way to provide extra information for our models. This is a way to try to separate the configuration between the staging, development, and production. And this is an example, like a, if you are using a official account in production, but then you are using to test a dev version for this Twitter account or something in, in staging in production, and you don't want to push this among the environments, so you create this kind of uh, things. And if you want to do a quick review about this, you just need to run config settings debug, and that will be provide the current key value uh, information in your site. Uh, the, the last three is like a, no, the last two is like a custom, but the others are like a, the, the values. When you install Drupal 8 by default, automatically you get a hash created, and then you have a container for the YAMLs created in your website. Okay. So in the Drupal console, I, I know it's, um, it's famous for code generation, but actually what I am trying to show you today is like a, we have like a three or four kind of commands. We have code generation, but we have debugging that I'm showing to, uh, here, and then we have a site administration um, commands to try to, to use their system. And we have this kind of commands like a, to try to help developer in the, comp in the whole process of development. Site statistics is a command and I think could be useful to try to do an assessment of our site. Like a, imagine, Maybe if you are a front-end developer, when you get a hire to create a team, uh, you need to know how big is the site. And what happens, usually the clients, they just provide the URL and they say, just browse, just browse in the website, and then you will have an idea. And obviously, you could spend four hours doing that, but the reality is not like that. But if you run this command, then you will have a, a better understanding a little bit uh, with a, a strong numbers about how big is the site? And what is important? Because you could say, okay, comment, zero. And then you say, okay, maybe they are using this cost. I don't need to create a template for that. Good. Or maybe you could say, okay, I have 755 co content types. So, right? So that's mean, okay, this is a, uh, and I am sure all of them are different among of them. So that means it's a lot of effort in templating. Uh, the same, it's, it's like a, to try to have a perspective. You say, okay, you say the guy, oh no, it's three times what you imagine, why? You say, this is why. <laughs> so it's something, so it's not my fault. But at least you have a, funda a foundation to say to the client, is this is because your site is like this. And if you don't have access to your request to your client, please stand the console, run this command, and then I will provide a, an estimation. We have some commands <clears throat> also to try. It, it, test our functions is important to test with content. For the reason we have some commands to create things. So we have commands to create user, node, taxonomies, vocabularies, and etc. And this looks similar to Jebel Generate, and it's because 
right now in Drupal core, we have a lot of things created inside the core. One of, the, one of them is create sample data. If you are trying to create a new field type, you need to implement in your class a method called like that, sample data. So the idea is uh, any content type could be created to make content by default. So what I, we did here and in Devil do the same via UI is just collect the information for how many content types you want to create, date creation, blah, blah, blah. And we call Drupal core functions and everything is created. So the idea is you don't need to, you, you don't need to install an external module to do this kind of uh, features. Okay, sign maintenance. So the idea is one of the most silly tasks that make most of the terrible problems in real life is put a website in production. And this is because the process to enable cache, disable cache, and these kind of things, uh, when you are going to production, it's like a, you need to click, right? And we are humans and we always forget the something. So you go to production and say, go live. Production is down. And it's for many reasons. Maybe the temporary director is different in staging than in production. Then your site goes down and everything. So we create a command to try to reduce the human interaction of that. Yeah. So we have two states, like a put dev and production. So obviously, if you are going, going to dev, we are disabled cache, uh, no, we are disabled CSS preprocess. JavaScript preprocess, cache pre -pro uh, usage, and we are enable the views query um, output and collect a statistic and enable the error level uh, log in our site. So this is exactly what you the uh, part of this uh, task are created using via UI. But the idea is don't let a human do something that a machine could do. Because we always forget, so you did the cache. Oh, yeah. Uh, but not really. Right? And then nobody was said, you have to do this. No, no, no. Nobody do that. And because you enable, now you have an action to try to, feed, to see what is happening in your views. And this is uh, for the login errors. So as you could see, I've got three, four, or five screens that you could do in one segment using a command. The second part of the side mode dev is to put in, in, in debugging the tweak stuff. So how you do that, and maybe this is complicated for some people, maybe because you don't understand really well about services in Drupal 8, but you need to create or modify a new file inside your Drupal site, which is services YAML. And then you need to put the specific entries in that file and if you, if you screw, your site is down. So it's better don't do that. So we enable the auto reload for tweak, we enable the cache, and we enable the debug, and we clear cache in our system. As a result, when you debug the HTML in your Drupal installation, you have obviously some suggestion about this piece of code could be completed in this case, in the, third, in the top, it's like a, we are using block HTML that tweak, but if you want to be more specific, you could use block bar tick search HTML that tweak. It's similar that we, we have this kind of stuff similar in, in Drupal 7, but for a front end developer, it's really good. But asking for a front end developer, say, hey, it's easy, just modify a service YAML file. You need to, to uh, don't use tab, it's only a space indentation, and do this for is. is it's not a point to do that, I, I, I think. But we are not perfect. <laughs> so how, it's usually we, in the development process, we screw our site and we don't have access to the database log. For the reason we have a command to get the latest message. So you just run Drupal database log the book and you could filter by limit <clears throat> or you could sort in the other way if you want. And when you get the ID, Obviously, you, you just need to run Drupal database log the book, the number of the log, and then you get the problem and try to solve. Again, a command that could be helpful for people which without a 
in software engineering background is the database table the book is you want to inspect what is your database why this is useful because in theory when you run an update of a module you maybe need to have new tables but maybe the update fail and you need to confirm if the table is there maybe you can use it or maybe you need to have maybe you have a new field inside the table and now in, in many Drupal um, console mod uh, commands, you have three or three parameters. In this case, if I only run database table the book, I get the full list of tables. But if I send a specific table, then I could get the definition of the table. And then you could say, okay, this, the update doesn't work because three columns are not there. So I need to check it out what happened. Yeah, the schema is the last parameter. No, this is the table, the database. Mm, you could, do you mean in the schema you have a revision? Uh, this is another command we have for that. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure if we include, but it's update. You could run Drupal update the book, you could see uh, if there are uh, updates pending, um, actually this is a, a good a good comment. It's outside this conversation, but um, sometimes when you are trying to update a Drupal site, maybe again we almost never are updated in our model, right? But then suddenly we get a um, security update. You have ten models to update, one security and none non security. But the problem is. The update PHP in Drupal until now is like a all updates must to run perfectly in order to apply everything. But if one of them fail, you cannot apply anyone. So what happens is people is hack the core or uninstall the model. And this is a bad idea because when you uninstall a model, you lose data usually. So don't do that. So I create a command is update execute that you could execute the update uh, isolated per model. And if you have uh, inside the model maybe five updates and the number five is failing, you could say, I want to, play, I, I want to apply the first four and then you, you apply those and leave the, uh, the other pending. But at least you could apply independently the security updates uh, in each model. In this way, your system will be a little more healthy. Okay, you, um, for non-technical guys, we have a database client. Uh, the image is not loading. But it's, it's basically open a, a client for SQLite or MySQL to try to execute queries and get the way how to connect to the database using command line. So storage. So one of the big changes in Drupal 8 and was like a, the, the main, the first announcement about changes in Drupal 8 was configuration management. Uh, because it's a way to try to separate data from content, right? Uh, so we have, we, we write these commands, write config the book, just to get a list of all available configuration. In, in a standard Drupal 8 installation, you have more than 200 configuration files. But if you want to inspect what is inside those files, you just need to send, to pass the key to try to get the information. So this is basic site information, and we have commands to override or to change the values there. Mm -hmm. But in Drupal A also we have a new concept, a state. So we have data, we have configuration management, and we have a state. So a states are temporary values that are only relevant for my current installation. That's mean, uh, as, you, as you can see here, we, uh, it's not in the list, but it's like, okay, yeah, it's the last time the cron was executed. So this is kind of information you don't want to push in production, because maybe it will be, have a strange behavior, because production have its own cycle of life, and dev have its own cycle of life. Actually. Um, sometimes when we create code, like a, to run a migration, to start the last migration here, and then we pass in production, and if we transfer these values to production, the migration is never gonna run, because the watermark is here. 
and maybe you are in, in reality you are, you are here, so you don't you don't want to export this. So it's important for this command to try to 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 debug what is happening in those variables, because sometimes and that's usually happen. My code works in my machines, works in staging, but in production <laughs> doesn't work. So when when that happens, the first thing you need to check is okay. Let's review the state variables, all the values, and compare with my system to say, oh, it's failing because this variable have an extra number or whatever. So we have commands to modify the value and try to restore our, our site. <clears throat> Again, a state is not a single value, right? Could be really complex, could be objects or whatever you have. In this case, it's like a to, <coughs> This what, it, what files are associated to the system team. In this case, it's like a per team, we have the info Jamal file for that. So maybe you could say, why my team is not working? And then you say, oh, why my, my, my new team is not, listed, is not listed here? So obviously your team is not, never is gonna work. But you have the option to edit and save and continue with, the, with your life. Services. How many of you know what is a service? Perfect, it could be 30%. Services is something we inherit from Symfony. For Symfony developers, it's a simple concept, but because in our history in Drupal, we have a lot of people without computer science background, and this is good. So people who learn by empiric, and now these people is feeling a little bit behind because there are really complex things related with com uh, in computer science that you, they need to learn. So the idea of Drupal Console is, uh, one of the ideas of Drupal Console is try to help these people to get on board in Drupal 8 easily. But services, in this case, is another story. Uh, any guess about how many services we have in a Drupal site installation by default? Mm -mm. Almost 700. And the, and the problem with services is like a, um, <laughs> it's about too much information and it's hard to try to find what is, what is in there. So from one of the things we want to do in Drupal console is like a, the UI in Drupal 8 is for me is a point of view on a story, right? It's the point of view for site builders or for publishers. But it's not the point of view for developers. It's like a, we are alone, nobody li like us. So it, it's, it's, not, it's not like a, it's not a way in the UI to see, oh, we have this service, I am going to use this. And then if you are getting Drupal 8, you say, hey, I want to do something. And then what I could do? So you need to swim and swim, or drunk or drunk, in the documentation to try to figure out something and do reverse engineering. And this is a nightmare. And I know because I suffer. <laughs> so services in general, let me explain this. Is, is, uh, services is a huge array of objects. So each, each service is an object inside this array with the whole information necessary to access content or some external service or whatever. So some people say it's like a, if you write a model and you want to expose the, any feature in your model, you create a service. It's like an API for a model. What happened in Drupal 7 sometimes when we want to create, a, use some fun function for a third party model like a roles or API, we need to use the ugly model include file, right? <laughs> and this is uh, it's like a really, really old school. So we don't do that anymore. We, if you want to do this, if you want to expose what your model do, like a flag or something, you create a service and then you include a service in your, mo in your model and you use. But how? If you have 700 models, how you determine what service is, is good for you? So we create this command, container the book, and then we print this array, 700. So just to give an idea, if you, if you are a Drupal 7 uh, developer, Everybody use the global variable user to try to determine if a user is connected or not. The problem is this is not longer available. So you need to use a service. And what service you need you can use if you are 700. 
So with this, you have at least the ID and you have the classes, right? So you could narrow this search, maybe saying uh, using grep to try to find, maybe if you, if you are trying to get the current user, maybe you filter by user or for session and try to inspect the classes. And this is a short uh, way instead of to read a lot of code in Drupal-A. So in this case, just for, for your information, the service used to determine if a user is connected or not is current user. So this is the service you need to inject in your controller to do that. And you could notice, like a, you, you narrow the search, and then you get the IDs, and then you pass as a, seg uh, as a parameter, and then you could uh, inspect quickly the class, and then discard. So I did the same, and then, oh, for this, it's anonymous. Ah, this is my service, right? Instead of to say, like, uh, what happened in the past is that you don't load a module, and they, oh, this module, they, they use login or, or not. So you read the logic of the module, and then you need to figure out. But it's more simple to try to say, uh, I narrow the service, I need to check the methods, and then I use. It's the same. <clears throat> Router the book. We don't have a way. Well, if, if you use a model named Web Profiler, you could get this information. They're both. But by default, it's not there. So by default, in a Drupal installation, we have about 200 routines. And if you see, a routine means anything, including variables inside. So you could use that. But, and why this is re useful? So imagine, and maybe this nothing happened to you, but maybe you have your clients, and they see a website, a, a, page in your site and say, I want the same, but with a checkbox extra. So just copy and paste. And this is how the client thinks it is, right? But in reality, what you do is like a, OK, the project manager say, Trans transmit the message, and then you try to find a string to search in the, in the code and try to figure out <laughs> which bit of code do that. In this, instead of to do that, we need to be more proactive. So you say, OK, he wants the same, the similar feature in this page or form, whatever. So say, give me the URL. So using grab, maybe you could narrow which URL match with the page the client one to get the ID. And when you get the ID, for instance, it's the user login, you get information about what is necessary to run, to run this controller. In this case, for user login, ID is a form, but could be a controller. And when you get this information, all you need to do is find this form in your code, and now you have the specific form, the client thing. You need to copy and paste, but now reality, in reality, you could copy and paste. And this is, if you, that means if you are using your proper tool, you could reduce the time, the, the waste time you use to try to do something that the client never valued for that. And obviously, you get some extra information. The thing is, when you do this for each routine, the output change. Because it could be the permission, the checking, whatever they do. And if this is a controller, it's different. And if, if a REST API change, so the idea is if uh, this is also useful if you create your, your own routine. Or if you think <laughs> you create your routine, but it's not working, you do this. And if not there, basically, you are screwed. You are doing something wrong in your routine. So it's a way to try to the book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, um, I, I am almost sure it's possible because this read, again, we have the services is a huge array, right? The routine is also another huge array. It's, an, it's in cache. So when you write, uh, what did you say, it's a routine subscriber, what happened is that changed all your routing and push and, and, and putting cash. So it must to be available in the router. This is this is why anytime you write a router subscriber, you need to rebuild the the road the, the routing and stuff. Events. <laughs> I'm going to talk about that. So we don't have hooks, sadly, right? But now we have events. So the idea and the problem we have with hooks is like a, when we try to when did, when do we try to 
determine what is happening and who I am trying to implement. It's really hard to, to de determine what happened before or after my implementation. So for the reason we have an event the book, you have the list of the books uh, events available. And if you pass something like at the kernel response, then you could get what implementations and what order is executed for this specific event. So that's when you say, okay, my output, I need to get the output from this event, and then I, I could continue. Obviously, you could play with the priority to do that. Sorry? I don't understand. Yeah, this is the order of execution. Mm -hmm. So the same for plugins. We, Drupal 8 is about plugins and services. So we have about 45 kind of plugins. So this, uh, all of them, all of this with the ID and the class implementation. But if you want to determine how many blocks are implemented in your system, then, then you, ha you have this list. And if you want to get more information about that, then you pass the latest uh, variable and then you get the class and everything. Uh, and again, this output change depends on the plugin. Maybe this is too simple, but some plugins like abuse filter or something, this information this is really useful for the, the developers. And Contrib, as I said, web profiler. Web profiler is like an X-ray for our services. Uh, you get information about everything. And I think, in my, in, in, in my opinion, you need to install Drupal with Composer, install com, com, Drupal Console, then you install Web Profiler, and now you are ready to start with Drupal A. And if you want to debug a little more, this is a library uh, for a symphony named Bar Dumper, and it's a module named Bar Dumper, and they allow to get this kind of output in, in, our, in our website to try to, to create, to structure things similar to Krumo, but I think this is a little better. And this is all I have. So if you have any question in the future, so feel free to do a um, question in, in Twitter using my handle and solutions. And this is the handle for Drupal console. Hello. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm just going to do some questions. I've got Alex here. Thanks for the presentation. Very great and interesting one. Uh, what is the command to get all the possible commands? This is like it's Drupal list. Drupal list. Mm -hmm. And it will give you all the sub commands and everything else? Yeah. So I could show you, Thank you. if I could uh, get out here. Any more questions while I do this? Uh -huh. So you could get Drupal list. And we have our command separated by name spaces. So if you want to get all commands related with generators, so Drupal list generator, if you want to get all commands related with configuration, like list configuration. We have about 148 models, uh, commands. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No more questions? Uh, yeah. oh. oh. That's cool. Um, uh, if we want to write our, or add our own commands, is there like a way of doing that? Like I know with Drush, you can add this Drush commands and you can add your own Drush commands in. Is there one for uh, yeah, Drupal you console? Your own commands in yeah, your models? Like, yeah, you, you can create your own commands. Actually, uh, commerce, they write their own commands for do that. And then we have a kind of inceptions. So we have a command to generate a command inside your model. No? I want to go back to earlier. You're doing some composer. You're talking about some composer things, and I saw one of the um, one of the dependencies you had there had a something JS. And questions come up. I've asked it. Other people have asked it around me before. Is there are there like can you use composers to install JavaScript libraries? Oh no 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 no! Oh, I understand but, your point. Again, this is outside. <laughs> So I, I have an article about that, about how to use React.js uh, in Drupal 8. Mm. Here. 
And you, I use Composer to install React.js and include that inside a Drupal module, inside Drupal. So actually, if you find Drupal AES, uh, ES6, this is the first, quest, the first resp uh, response in the Google. No? So um, we'll wrap it up there. The final question I want to ask is, do you have your bash prompt in a, in a gist somewhere? My what? Your bash, your bash prompt. Can you ah, your... this is fish. 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 Oh, OK, yep. So fish is like a souped up, who is that? Souped up shell. Um, OK, thank you, everyone. Please thank uh, Eduardo Enzo. <laughs>